Welcome class. We're going to talk about Chapter 2, Managing GIS Data. GIS data, as you probably saw in the last lecture, they're quite different. So we have to organize, manage, and also add information such as metadata to some of these files. Okay, again, GIS data are very different. They're very large. Sometimes multiple users are um, obtaining data. You have lots of different types. You, you can't really use uh, you know, spaces and certain characters like you can in other files in Windows. And the formatting can actually be quite complicated. If you take a look here on the side, on the right side, this is what a building's shapefile would look like if you're using Windows Explorer. There are multiple files. And sometimes, depending on projection information or metadata, you might have different number of files. This is why our catalog, which we'll talk about in this lecture, is very useful for GIS data. So organizing data, you know, a lot of people have uh, you know, differ, uh, different opinions on how to do this, but from the standpoint of this book, we're going to use folders. So it's really a good idea to organize your data using folders. And as you can see here, the data that come from the book are organized within the MGIS data set. And you will get this data. Um, it, it comes with the book, but unfortunately they don't give you um, the data with the book anymore. I have the data on a shared drive in the GIS lab. So you've got to be aware also of where you are saving data when you're doing certain processes because the default location unfortunately ArcGIS uses a strange default location that's not always the best place also when you're naming files just like with anything probably want to use a better name than what it gives you for example if you're using a raster it may give you a, a default name of raster calc 1 that's not really um, very descriptive, but if you're dealing with snail habitats, then I would just you know, call it snail habitats. Okay, never ever ever use spaces in folders or file names. File names especially, ArcGIS will not allow you to do uh, file names. You know, sometimes the folder can have a space, but if you're doing a certain prog a process or tool every once in a while it will not like that space in the folder you want to use letters numbers and if you want to make a space do it underscore and keep your your folders pretty short the, the names itself at least relatively short so one thing you might want to do when you are using Windows is, is make sure that you have your file extensions uh, shown and you can go to the folder options view and um, unclick the hide extensions that way you know what the extension is because there are several types of GIS data and you want to know what extension it is so where do we get data now this course we're not going to be focusing on going out and getting data but all of your other GIS courses after this, there will be some component of getting data. So I just want to put out some information on data sources and GIS sources. We have ARC News, which is something that we get every, I think it's every season, every three months. And we have copies of these in the GIS lab. You could also use GIS Online or ArcGIS Online. And there are various organizations that uh, deal with GIS. For example, the GIS Certification Institute is something that you might want to look at when you are, let's say, out in the field, in the workforce, and you want to get some sort of credential that you are a GIS expert. Finding data can be very difficult and sometimes very time consuming. Like I said, in this course, we're not going to necessarily look at um, or uh, practice finding data, but just for your information, data.gov is a really useful source for GIS data for North America. 
you could also just use a Google or any kind of search engine. Now when you're using Google you or a search engine, you want to put the topic then a plus then GIS. Or if you're looking for shapefiles, put your topic. Or if you're looking for other type of uh, GIS, GIS data like EOO files, that's a, a format that you might see on um, on a website and you can actually in our toolbox which we'll talk about later you can actually uh, convert that into something useful like a shapefile. These are some other useful sites national map you can actually map out what you want and then export the data the USGS uh, United States Geological Survey they have quite a bit of data the Center for Disease Control and any kind of city planning especially for LA they usually have some pretty good uh, data sources now sometimes when you are getting data from uh, uh, online source or even in this course you have to unzip the file Basically, zipping allows you to place multiple files into one file. So for example, all of these state con files, this is all one shape file. But if you're giving this to somebody, then you want to zip it so you're just um, you know, sending one file instead of all these other files that you could accidentally uh, you know, leave one out and then the shape file wouldn't work anymore. Of course, if you're working in Windows, you could always download something called 7-Zip or even use WinZip to download these. Scale. So scale is something I talked about in the last lecture. And just, um, just as a review, and especially when you're trying to get data for a certain region, you really have to understand the scale at which these data were drawn or produced. Basically, the larger the scale, the more detailed the boundaries of, let's say, I don't know, let's say this is a boundary of a state. As you can see, the, uh, let's see, this boundary right here, I'm colorblind, so I'm pretty sure that's orange. The orange line represents one to five million. So that's pretty rough. Unlike, well, look at the purple line. The purple line is even worse. That's 1 to 25 million. But then the black line right here is uh, actually only 1 to 50,000. It's the most detailed. So basically, the larger the scale, the, most, the more detailed you will get. And if you're trying to place data on top of each other, especially vector data, you probably want to make sure that um, you have very similar uh, spatial scales that these uh, data were drawn or produced so that you your boundaries will match. This is an issue when you were out there trying to gather data online. Now also when you gather data, whether you're creating data or uh, downloading data from another source, you really need to have metadata. Metadata basically is data about the data. You need to know information about that data. And I mentioned this last time in my last lecture, uh, and you will learn more about this in GIS 33. One of the uh, standards for metadata is the FGDC. And it really is nice because it has, again, certain uh, pieces of information that you have to have to complete and be certified uh, as part of the FGDC metadata. And this is just some interesting uh, or, or relevant uh, information for New Jersey elevation contours. The summary just gives you sort of uh, an idea of what the uh, data uh, represents and what it's for. The description goes in a little bit more detail. The credits. The credits, you have to credit the, the uh, person or company that created the data and having a date is also extremely important. There also might be use limitations, whether that means you shouldn't use it at a certain scale or perhaps you need to have, um, you know, or you, you might have to contact 
the uh, agency that created this data before you can use it because there could be some licensing issues. And then there's a lot more to metadata, but the bottom line here is you really want to have good metadata anytime that you are gathering data from other sources. Uh, and if you are creating data like digitizing, which we'll, ta we'll talk about in GIS 33, you have to create metadata for that as well. Essentially, data without metadata are pretty useless. Okay, so we talked about the map document also in chapter one, and this is just a review. I want to point out that, again, right here is the table of contents. These are the layers right here that are shown in the map document on the right. Remember, the map document, the MXD file, just refers the, uh, the, the graphics that you see in the map document and links it to the data that's re that resides somewhere else. The data itself are not within the map document. It only displays that. That way, you know, if let's say there's 10 people that want to use Oregon data, uh, we only have to have the data set in one location. And then these 10 people that might be sp spread across, who knows, like the whole country, um, can create maps from that data and we don't have to have 10 copies of that data. So it's much more efficient to have the data residing in one place and then having maps refer to that same data. Just like you guys, who, um, all of you will be using certain data sets within the, the stuff that came from the book and you might all go home and be working on that data. You probably have your own copies um, because you don't, we can't log into the shared uh, data here in, in the GIS lab. But when you're using, um, let's say you have to create multiple Oregon uh, maps, you will not have to have multiple copies of uh, the Oregon data set. You will just refer to the one location that the data set, the Oregon data set will be. So again, GIS data are shared. As you can see here, there are three maps and each map is linked to Oregon counties. And you don't have to have three separate copies. Now, later on, we'll talk about a map package, which what's great about a map package is that you can actually send an MXD with the data and I can open it up on my computer and it, everything is there. You will not be able to just send me the MXD file because again, the MXD file does not contain the data. GIS data are shared. So this just gives you another example of how map documents are uh, shared on the same file. You know, the same data may be used by many maps. Shipping maps without the data is pretty useless. Also, if you start to move your GIS data around and you don't go into the MXD and change the, the data links, then you could cause many problems. Even renaming a GIS data could cause problems. So you got to make sure you know all of your MXD files that you have. And if you're going to change a name or change a location, you need to go to those map documents, the MXDs, and also change it in there. Change the link at least. This is probably one of the most annoying part, parts of ArcGIS, but this is a kind of a good thing. So when you have an ArcMap document open, an MXD file, and it has, you know, let's say all of the Oregon data in your map, and then you open up our catalog, which is like Windows Explorer for ArcGIS. And let's say you try to rename one of those Oregon data sets while the MXD is open. It will lock the files. So it will not allow you to change that name if you have it open. However, you can close all ArcGIS uh, programs and still open it back up and have a file lock. So uh, the first step to remove a file lock is, again, close the program, but ArcGIS doesn't always uh, recognize that. So then you might need to close it again. And sometimes we just have to reboot, uh, reboot the computer as a last resort. So 
this is what happens. So what if you did change the either the um, the name or the location of data, and then you open up your MXD file, and you see this sort of grayed out checkbox with an exclamation point. That means it cannot find the uh, source. So what you need to do is go back into the properties of ArcGIS. Well, no, I should say the properties of the data set in ArcGIS and go to set data source. And before you do that, you should know where it is. For example, uh, in class, I might have MGIS data slash USA slash supersize SHP. But when I go home and I put the stuff on the flash drive, my uh, my drive letter is not C anymore, it's D. And if you have absolute paths, which we'll talk about a little bit later, then it will not be able to find it. So you have to just go into the data source, find the data, and then link it back. Um, this could be quite time consuming if you have um, moved a lot of your data. So, you know, there are some best practices when it comes to um, organizing your data to try to minimize uh, these uh, broken links. So one way you can do this, again, is not to use uh, absolute paths. But if you use absolute path, which means that it, it remembers the entire path, even the drive letter, often, again, you will use, um, even if you use a USB in the classroom, you, you plug your USB in and the computer decides it wants to use, I don't know, letter drive E. And then you go home and you, you put your um, flash drive into your personal computer and it, wanna, it wants to use letter drive F. Well, if you use an absolute path, then it'll be broken. But if you use a relative path, the, it, do, it, it basically ignores the drive letter and just uses the immediate um, uh, information of the, of the path to find your data. But nonetheless, if you have to fix a broken link, you want to use set data source. So this is, again, showing you the difference between absolute path and relative path. So absolute paths, again, go all the way back to the drive letter. Relative path just uses the folder that's, that the data is in. This kind of gives you, uh, you know, using these arrows here gives you an idea of the difference between absolute and relative paths. Basically, relative paths just goes one level up. Why would you use absolute paths? And why would you use relative paths? Well, absolute paths are okay if you never move anything. Basically, if you don't move your map and don't move the data, then absolute paths works. But if you have data that you're gonna move or you're gonna send to another organization, you wanna use relative paths. In fact, I just automatically, um, within ArcGIS, this is a, something I will show you um, in class, I automatically make sure that my map documents use relative paths. I don't know why ArcGIS um, default is is absolute paths. I, I think that's actually annoying. <laughs> You'll see there's a, a few, you know, little hiccups and annoyances with the software. But um, uh, yeah, nonetheless, I go in there and I, the first thing I do is make sure it's all in relative paths. Paths is the, is the way to go. Okay, so to view and organize and edit, oh, not really edit, but edit metadata, uh, you want to go to the ARC catalog. Now, in the ARC map uh, document, on the right-hand side, you can see an ARC catalog window. But ARC catalog is also its own program. So right here are just some of the things that um, you will uh, see when you open up our catalog. Now, your data will not automatically display, so the, one of the first things you're gonna have to do 
is you're going to have to connect to file folders. So you click on this button and it gives you a window, just like Windows Explorer, to uh, set up your data. So then after that, you have, let's say, I set up my data and Mount Baker is my geodatabase I want to work with. You can add feature classes, you can look at the data itself, whether it's in the uh, folder or you preview it, preview it here, you can see the geography and table, you can see the metadata here. So there's quite a bit of stuff that you can do in our catalog. Again, the first thing you probably want to do is connect to your folder. It's not going to be connected automatically. If you are using the C drive, which most people won't be using the C drive, then you might see the data in our catalog. Otherwise, you're going to have to add the, um, the drive letter that your USB uh, drive uses. Again, you can see the, the data when you open up the contents. You have various options of looking at the data. You can look at icons all the way to actually looking at some of the geography of the data. And then you have a preview. And in this case, you can actually just preview the data, whether it's the geography or it's the table. Now, you don't have mapping capabilities like you do in ArcGIS. But you can still zoom in and zoom out and move around and, and, and look at things, but you're not going to be able to add like any colors or symbology or anything, anything like that. And the tables are actually really interesting to look at because you do have quite a bit of functionality in our, in our catalog uh, for the tables. You can sort, you can add a field, you can change names or aliases really. Um, but the problem with this is you, you get again you got to make sure that when you're playing around with the data and you're changing it that um, that it's okay for any map that uses that data to have this new you know, new look or or new values for the data. Obviously, if you're using brand new data that's not mapped anywhere, then you're probably fine. But if you are, then you just got to be very careful. I mean, GIS data. Um, is very large. Sometimes it can be very, you know, clunky. And also, there isn't always an undo button. So if you make a mistake outside of an edit session, which is basically stuff we'll talk about in GIS 33, then your, then your, um, if you make a mistake, your changes are permanent. It's always a good idea to have a backup copy of your data somewhere just in case something like this happens. It might sound like I'm paranoid, but trust me, you do not want to um, screw up a data set in ArcGIS because you may not be able to go back unless you do a lot of work. So having an extra copy is good. Fortunately for this class, I have a, a clean copy of, of the data you'll be using. So if you make a mistake, or if someone actually makes a mistake on the share drive, then um, I have a copy for you guys uh, to use instead. It happens sometimes in class, and so just keep that in mind. You still want to be very careful, but just keep that in mind. And then in, in our catalog, you can, this is where you can really see, uh, evaluate, and uh, even import metadata. And that's under the description tab. Okay, so let's say we want to look at some of the file properties. Now in our map, you can actually right click and go down to properties and you'll see properties that you um, want to see or need to see while you're mapping data. In our catalog, you will see additional properties. You'll have um, you'll, you'll be able to actually look at the coordinate system and, and you might want to use our toolbox to change the coordinate system. That stuff we'll talk about in chapter three. If you're dealing with um, topology and geodatabases, you will look at domain and resolution and edit tracker is something I never really look at. General, the general tab is very important. So you kind of want to just look at the stuff and see some of the, um, uh, the features that the, well, the feature class has. Now, 
we're back to Arc Map. Rem remember, you can view your data as a catalog window on the side. And basically, you want to open it up. Really, it should be right here. You want to open up your Arc Catalog by, by using that. And if you want to look at that data in a little bit more detail like you did in our catalog, you can right click on the data and open up the properties. That is different than going over here and looking at the properties here. These properties are going to be different than the properties you see here. So for example, you might just want a quick, just a quick review of the metadata. So you can actually while you're in the art catalog window, you can actually right click on the item description and see some of the metadata. You won't be able to edit it and you won't be able to import or export, but you'll just be able to view it. And you can even view the geography of it if you really need to. Okay, art catalog, and this is stuff I've already said, but this is just so important, I, I need to, I need to uh, emphasize it again. Art catalog and the catalog window make permanent changes. And they do not warn you if you make a change and there's no one to, so you gotta be super careful while working catalog. Again, having that uh, backup data set is a good idea too. Sometimes students get the table of contents mixed up with the catalog. And that is, that's unfortunate because over here in the table of contents, if you delete something or remove something, all you're doing is you're removing it from the map, you're not deleting the data set itself. However, if you're making changes over here, those are permanent. And so just be careful. And remember the catalog window by default opens up on the right hand side, where the table of contents by default opens up on the left hand side. Technically, you could actually move these windows around if you want. But best practice, at least for me, is to keep the table of contents on the left-hand side and keep the catalog window on the right-hand side. Arc Toolbox. Now, Arc Toolbox is something that we will um, deal with a bit more later, but it's another window that you can actually open up. And it has a lot of tools. And these tools are very powerful, and, and most of them, are key to understanding and doing spatial analysis. So when you double click, let's say on the tool called intersect, a window will open up and it will guide you to what you need to add in here to create an intersect. And if you don't know what an intersect is, which you won't, you probably don't know because we're going to deal with this in chapter 10, then you can read the help. There's a lot of help. Uh, ArcGIS has, just tons of resources just within the program itself to help you understand, uh, you know, not just tools, but basically any aspect of the software. There are hundreds of Arc Toolbox features depending on what license level you have. It runs in both Arc Map and Arc Catalog. You can even customize your own tools and create your own tools. In spatial analysis and modeling class, which is GIS 38, we will be dealing with, I, I'm not sure if I'm gonna teach it, um, but most likely if I do, we will deal with creating our own toolboxes using Model Builder. And because there are hundreds of tools, there are also, um, uh, there's also a window here for searching. And let's say you know you have a very specific tool you want to use, but you just can't find it in the Arc Toolbox window. You can go to search, and it will find it right for you. It's this is something that's really nice that came out in ArcGIS 10. Okay, now we have talked about geodata geodatabases quite a bit, and uh, we are going to look into Chapter 13 and just get a just get a start a hint on what GIS data uh, look like and what you can do with a geodatabase. Geodatabases are unique to ArcGIS. We have feature data sets, which include multiple feature classes, and you can have different types of geometry within each feature data set. 
Now the key to the feature data set is that you want to have some kind of thematic uh, characteristic among your data or all your data must be in, in one area because all of your data within a feature data set must have the exact same coordinate system. And feature classes are kind of like shape files. They only allow one geometry, but they are organized at least within a geodatabase. And it's also very useful if you are uh, sharing your data. And just showing you a couple of other things that we add in there. Annotation, like I said before, topology, network topology, which might be something that you look at in GIS 33. This is a much more complete list. So, for example, let's say you have a, a geodatabase called My Geodatabase, and then you have a featured data set called Canada. Within Canada, we have cities, we have annotation, which are just labels that have a little bit more fluc fl uh, flexibility. Place names, we have uh, polygons, and we have topology. And then you can also add all sorts of different things. When you work in a GIS at a large company, you might have database connections in a central location where all your geodatabases reside. And that's what these uh, database connections are talking about here. We are going to look at default attributes in GIS 33, but I want to introduce it here because we are talking about geodatabases. One of the advantages of having a geodatabase is that you could set default values while you're either digitizing or editing data. So for example, let's say I'm adding another feature in this feature uh, class, and every time I have the attribute street, I want the default value to be ST. That way, every single time I'm dealing with a street, the abbreviation is ST and not like STR or the full name. It, it uh, again, it not only saves time, but also standardizes some of your um, attribute information. You could also have domains, which basically limit what you can put in the table. For example, pipe sizes are, are only come in 1 inch, 3 inch, 6 inch, and 12 inch. So if you go ahead and code those domains you know, for the table that you're going to be editing, it, it ensures that you don't add like a 2 inch or a 7 inch because those don't exist. Or let's say on the right hand side here, you have a field called percent and you want to make sure that no um, values outside of uh, 100 or outside of 0 and 100 are inputted into that table so there are certain rules that you can set up in your geo database that help you with editing and it reduces uh, consistency errors and other types of errors now subtypes is similar too. Now this is a way to link symbology to um, your table. Symbology, which we'll talk about in chapter four, is just sort of the look, you know, the, the cartography, the, the symbol that you use for certain um, uh, map uh, entities. And so having uh, subtypes, let's say for example, we have roads. Now roads, we have different you know, kinds of roads. We have highways, we have you know interstates, we might have a ramp. In this case here, anytime that you digitize a highway, then you have various um, uh, attribute data that go into the table. But if you're um, uh, digitizing a local road, then different attribute uh, information will pop up into the table. So this again will be something you'll deal with in GIS 33. Creating a geodatabase is extremely simple. And file geodatabases are the, are the, the best that uh, you want to use. Personal geodatabases, we don't use them too much. Essentially, one way to do this is just to right click on whatever folder in our catalog, wherever, whatever folder you want that geodatabase to be in. Okay, in this case, we're using Austin. Then you want to go down to New and then you want to highlight File Geodatabase. 
You could also, within our toolbox, create a file geodatabase. The most common way is in our catalog. If you have your geodatabase, if you have data that you want to input into that geodatabase, then you just right click on that geodatabase, go to import, and import whatever you need to um, uh, you know, use in that uh, database. You can um, create a new uh, file label, basically a file name, and you have an option of adding or deleting fields. A feature class. So if let's say you want to add a brand new feature class, that's easy too. So you right click on the geodatabase, you go down to new and then feature class, you add the name to it, you need to add the you know the coordinate system. Uh, you probably want to accept the default values when it comes to XY tolerance, and then you have to create a name. And then you click finish. When you do that, now what you're doing is instead of importing data into it, um, you're actually just creating a new data set, and then you have to later on add stuff to that by digitizing um, or uh, importing data from a different source. You can also create a featured data set. And within a feature data set, you want your feature classes to have some kind of theme or at least be in one particular area. Because remember, you have to have the exact uh, same coordinate system for all of the feature classes. This is just another way of organizing your data within a, in a geo database. And it's also a good way to build topology and maybe even networking. Creating a feature data set is just as easy as creating a feature class. So you want to, again, highlight in our catalog the geo database, go to new, go to feature data set, give it a name, but then you are forced to give it a coordinate system, which everything inside of it will have that coordinate system. Vertical coordinate system and the XY tolerance, you'll probably want to keep that as a default. So I hope you understand a little bit more about GIS data and how you can organize and manage GIS data. It really takes a lot of practice. Practice, practice, practice is, is the key to understanding GIS in general. Thank you and I'll see you next time.